Hello, good morning. So um, it's time to make a start on this. What a lovely audience. If you don't mind, I'm just going to take a quick uh, selfie of you guys and ladies. Because normally nobody turns up for my talks. <laughs> well, some people do. OK, so we need to talk about System D. Um, let's get through this stuff. This is me. I've done some stuff. Skip that. So um, yeah, some of you may remember a couple of years ago, I did a talk on boot time reduction, boot time optimization, which you can find at that URL there. And um, it was mostly focused on the bootloader and the kernel uh, parts. When it came to the user space part, I kind of bailed out, and I just put in an init equals whatever program I was running. So when I boot up, it just runs, uh, in this case, Qt demo, whatever. Um, which started really, really fast. Got to say that was a good solution, but it doesn't always work out because there may be some other dependencies. So uh, in this talk, I really want to look at the things I was missing out uh, in doing it that way. So this talk then is going to be, well, initially it was going to be about um, a really hard focus on, on uh, boot time optimization. But then I kind of discovered that um, as I delved into this, I was having to describe more and more stuff. So it's kind of more slightly into a introduction to system D uh, and then some boot time optimization following that. So I'm going to be covering what is system D, what does it do? Um, a bit of an introduction to, as to how System D works. Uh, then we talk about uh, optimizing boot time. And then there are a couple of topics I want to cover at the end before we're all finished. Um, I've got to say that this is not, if anybody here is expecting um, a, the real deep dive into System D, this is actually not that talk. Uh, this is the embedded um, programmer's view of System D and how the hell do we make this thing work. So first of all, init daemons. Uh, what do init daemons do? You've got to have an init daemon, otherwise nothing is ever going to happen. So the init daemon is the program that's launched immediately after the kernel has booted. So once the kernel has got up to its, uh, done its initializing of its all in internal structures and device drivers or whatever, it execs uh, the very first program, which therefore has process identifier PID 1. And then init starts running. And it starts a whole bunch of other daemons. It configures a bunch of stuff through various obscure means. And um, sorry, that's in the wrong place. Um, and then once it's done the, the initialization, it will then sit in the background just waiting for things to happen. Um, so part of, it has to, part of things it has to do at this stage is um, it, it's, it's the parent of last resort. So when a uh, process dies which has children, then those children get reparented to init, for example. Um, it also is monitoring uh, some of those demons and restarting them as necessary. And it's also killing off zombies and all, the, all kinds of other exciting stuff. So there are uh, several init demons we may consider. Um, so here I'm looking at three, uh, BusyBox, System 5, and System D. So System, uh, sorry, BusyBox init is the simplest of the lot. Um, it's part of BusyBox, so there's no uh, real overhead to it. It's just a couple of shell scripts, and it kind of works. So for simple embedded systems, that is by far the best thing to use. Um, system 5 init, on the other hand, is a bit more uh, flexible than BusyBox init. It has this concept called run levels, and you can switch from one run level to another, which allows you to start and stop a bunch of demons when you make that switch. Um, but System 5 init is kind of slow because it's a bunch of shell scripts. Each one of those shell scripts takes time to launch and so on. Plus, it is 30 odd years old. So then we have System D. Um, which is the, the modern way of doing things. Um, and that's what we're going to talk about, basically. 
So system D, it is not just an init daemon. It is a way of life. <laughs> well, kind of. So system D is, uh, aims to be a general purpose uh, system manager. And it does a whole bunch of things. I've listed, I mean, I, if I were to list every, every component of system D, it wouldn't fit on the slide. So I've edited things down a little bit. Um, but the things that are important to us are the system D itself. Uh, there's a journal, uh, journal D, which is doing the event logging, kind of replacement for the old uh, syslog stuff. Um, there's the login daemon, which is handling logins on uh, terminals and such like. Uh, the uevent daemon, uh, uDev uh, has been uh, around for a long time, um, but it's now integrated as part of system D. Uh, and UDEV, UDEV is basically managing the dev directory and also handling hot plug and other kernel events. Uh, network daemon does what it says. It configures network interfaces. Time sync daemon, handy for synchronizing your clock. And resolve daemon is basically a wrapper around uh, DNS resolve. So those are the kind of things that we want. Those are the kind of services we want in our, in our, in our embedded systems. So, why system D? Why go to all this trouble? Um, so system D is kind of reinvented from the, the ground upwards. Uh, it started in 2010, I think, by Leonard Pottery, Pottering and Kay Sievers uh, at Red Hat. And they basically started with a clean sheet of paper and said, how should we design a system uh, startup uh, daemon? So, it is, it, we have now explicit dependencies between um, services, whereas back in the old um, uh, uh, system five init days, the only ordering was, was by the number of the, of the script you put into the uh, RC dot whatever directory. Um, it, given that uh, dependency information, it can build up a dependency tree at boot time and then by walking through the tree, we can then do parallel starts as we walk back up the tree. Uh, at each branch node, we, we start everything at that level and then work back up to the root. So theoretically, at least, it should be faster because we're doing things in parallel. No more shell scripts. Uh, so system D doesn't re re uh, depend on shell scripts, so that's a, that's a definite plus. Plus, there are some handy things which are good for embedded. So we'll look at this uh, briefly at the end of the presentation, but we have per daemon resource control. So we can set uh, CPU and memory limits on each program if we wish. And it has built-in support for watchdogs, so we can set a watchdog. Uh, so that if a daemon stops responding for some reason, it stops responding to the watchdog, uh, it will get restarted. So all the kind of things that we need uh, in our systems. So, the aim then is to, for, at this point, is for me to describe the, the base, some of the basic uh, concepts behind system D. And I'm attacking it from the point of view of units, services, and targets. I believe if you understand these three things, you basically understand system D. So a unit um, is a thing. Everything is a unit, it's a, it's a text file. Uh, a service is a particular sort of unit which describes a service, in other words, a program that you run. And then a target is a group of services. So as we go down that list, we go from the, the particular to the general. So that's a quick look at these things. So system D units, um, they're just text files and they live in one of these three directories. Uh, the nice thing is that when systemd goes looking for a, a unit or any other configuration files, it scans these directories in this order. So it looks in the etc, systemd, system directory first, then it looks in the run directory, and then it looks in the lib directory. The idea then is that the stuff you put into system, uh, sorry, into etc, systemd system, this is the local configuration. Anything you want to change, you do in that directory. Whereas the stuff that's in uh, the lib directory, lib system D system, that is the system default stuff. If you do nothing in the etc directory, then what is in the lib directory wins. 
So that means it's very easy to customize stuff. You just put new, new units into ETC, system D system, and they will override whatever the system defaults are in the lib directory. Uh, so for example, as it says at the bottom, if you want to disable a unit, um, the quick and dirty way to do it is uh, either create an empty file with the same name in the ETC system D system directory, uh, or if you want to be a bit fancy about it, you can create a file that's a, a link to dev null. So units. Um, a unit is, well, it, the, all the things we're going to talk about are, are going to be units. Every unit begins with a section marked unit. And in my example here, we have a description, which is just some uh, human readable uh, code, uh, message rather. We have documentation, which references a man page in this case. And then we have a dependency, which we'll come to in a moment. So the dependencies. The dependencies are the crucial bit because by reading the dependencies of all the units, uh, systemd can build the dependency graph, and then it can do its uh, parallel uh, execution thing. So in the previous example, we have a requires. So requires is the most common sort of dependency. It says this unit requires some other unit, or units can be multiple. So that means that those units, when, when I start this unit, uh, it should start up the other units as well. Uh, you can also have wants, which is kind of like requires, but less, uh, uh, it's a weaker form of requires. In other words, if the, um, uh, if the unit, uh, the, if, if, if I have a wants instead of requires, it's not fatal if uh, the, the, the wanted unit doesn't start. And then conflicts is the opposite of requires. If I have a unit that conflicts with another unit, it means the two cannot coexist at the same time. If I start this unit, it will stop the other unit. If the unit gets started, it's going to stop this unit. Okay, but we can't have them both. And then we have another similar concept called order. So the requires, et cetera, is the dependencies. The order is the order we'd like things to, to happen. They are different concepts, different things. Uh, so typically, if I put uh, here that, um, where was this? Well, okay, in this particular unit, uh, it says after network target. So that means that when we start this uh, unit up, which is gonna be a web server, then it, we're gonna start this after, in this case, network target is started. Which kind of makes sense because a web server doesn't make much use without, <coughs> without a uh, network. So after is kind of similar to require but also different. Uh, so just as an example, if I have uh, three services, A, B, C, if I say A uh, requires uh, B and C, and it uh, is after B, then that means that we, so when it processes, processes that requires statement, it'll actually start all three things or can start all three things up in parallel. But if I put in a, uh, an after statement, after B, for example, it means it's gonna start basically uh, C and then B, and then it will start A. Okay, so we're introducing some order into the way things are gonna happen. If you don't add in an ordering, then it's just however system D chooses to do it. So that's the unit section. The next bit then is a service. So a service is a particular sort of unit, and it has uh, a unit section, and then it's followed by, in this case, a service section. This is again for the uh, light TTPD service. Um, so in the service section, we basically say what program it is we want to run and any parameters we want to specify there. So the key thing here is the exec start statement, which gives the name of the program, light TTPD, and the parameters required to run that. And in my example here, there's an exec reload, which says that if we do a reload of this service, uh, you'll do that by uh, sending a kill minus hub to whatever PID it happens to be running with. And then the third part of the, of the triumvirate is the target. 
So target is a group of services. So targets, they're units, they end in .target, and they look something like this. The interesting thing is that when you look at targets, initially I thought that if I looked at a target, it would have a whole bunch of dependencies on services. So that if I start, for example, the multi-user target, I would expect to see all the services required uh, for multi-user. In fact, when you look at a target, uh, such as this one here, the dependencies are just on other targets. So how does that work? Well, I'll come to that in a moment. Oh yeah, so I meant, I've, I've slightly forgotten this bit here. There is a thing called a default target. This is that link uh, shown there. This is the target that's gonna be started when you boot up. Uh, so it's uh, called default target. It's a symbolic link in this case to multi-user target, which would be uh, the, uh, the non-graphical login. So, yes, how do these dependencies with targets actually work? And the answer is it all works by reverse dependencies. So we have two more keywords here, requires and wants. So these are called outgoing dependencies. So essentially, uh, I can, within my service, I can say my service um, uh, is wanted by uh, the multi-user target. So instead of having a pointer from multi-user target to my service, it actually goes the other way. And then when it starts a multi-user target, it will see that it's wanted by a whole bunch of other services, so it will then start them all up in the right order. And the way this is actually implemented is kind of interesting. It's done with a bunch of symbolic links. So if you look um, actually in the ETC system D system multi-user target wants directory. So this is the list of incoming dependencies, in this case for the target multi-user target. And there you will see there are symbolic links created by the wanted buys uh, for each one of the services. So in this case uh, here it's uh, for something called simple service, which is just a demo program. Okay, and if you look further in that directory, you'll see there's symbolic links for every single one of these things. And then I need to talk a little bit about system CTL. So this is the, the driver program which allows you to control system D and make it do different things. So you can do a whole bunch of things with system CTL. This is just a, a brief list. But we can, for example, start and stop a unit, for example, a service. Uh, we can enable a unit. So when you enable a unit, this is the point at which it installs that symbolic link we've just been talking about. So if I enable, uh, in this case, simple server, that's the point at which it creates that symbolic link. If you are shipping a system which has a bunch of units enabled by default, then essentially your system image will have these, li li these links already created in the uh, lib systemd system directory. And if you're using Pocky or build root or whatever, that will create the, the symbolic links for you in the image before you put it onto the target. Uh, disable just deletes that symbolic link. It's easy enough. And then status tells you what it's doing. Uh, get default tells you what the default target is. There's also a set default if you want to change that symbolic link for the default target. And then list dependencies shows you a nice little graph showing how all these dependencies work. So that's a kind of the, as much as I want to go into right now. So that's kind of, hopefully, despite my slightly garbled description of all this stuff, you got an idea then of how the dependencies, how the ordering of uh, systemd allows it to bring things up in a particular order. So what do we, uh, how do we apply this then to reducing boot time? So I'm defining boot time here as the time from powering on to running the, the app, the critical app. Typically then, what you are doing at this point is you have some generic image generated by your favorite build tool like 
build route or Yocto project, um, or maybe you're even using a standard off-the-shelf distro like Debian or something. These images are generated uh, to cover uh, a variety of circumstances, possibly different hardware, uh, different configurations or whatever. So they tend to be quite conservative in the things they're going to do because they have to work in all circumstances. In most cases then, reducing boot time is taking something that's generic and making it specific to your particular use case. And there are basically two ways you can do this, apart from rewriting the whole thing. Um, the simplest thing is just to leave out stuff you don't really need. So if it's running a bunch of daemons you don't need, or if it's configured some, some uh, uh, interfaces that you don't require, you can just tell systemd to ignore those things. The other thing that can sometimes be a win is doing things in a different order. So sometimes it's, uh, it, it's, it's a win to be able to start your critical program ahead of stuff that's less critical. Um, system D comes with a bunch of, uh, well, it comes with a tool called System D Anal Analyze, which has a bunch of options to get information about what System D is up to. So this is the key, the main tool uh, I would use, uh, I, I do use for running, uh, for optimizing System D. So you can just try System D Analyze, and it gives you a, a brief summary, a one-line summary of what's been going on. Uh, then you've got blame, system D analyze blame, which gives you a list of all the units that it's run to get to boot up and tells you how long each one of those took and then it orders them from the longest to the shortest. Which is kind of interesting, but really the key one is the last one on this list here, critical chain. This takes the, the critical path from startup to um, whatever the default uh, target is and it tells you which units were affecting that, uh, that path. Uh, so really, the critical chain is, is where you want to start. You look at what is taking the time, what are things on the critical path, and then you start optimizing those things. So as an example, then, I have um, some example dumps of system D analyze, which I took on this little pocket beagle, which I happen to have um, left over from yesterday, being at the uh, E, the embedded apprentice Linux engineer thing down in uh, uh, yeah, the thing that, Debian, that uh, Behan's running. So uh, that's running a copy of Debian stretch. And when I run systemd analyze, it tells me this. Um, so it's taking quite a long time to boot the kernel. I haven't done anything to optimize that, but it's 18 seconds. Um, but then the user space is taking 47 and a bit seconds. So the total boot time is one minute and a bit. Um, so obviously there is some optimization to be done here. If we run uh, blame, we see a whole bunch of things. So the one that's at the top of the list is called board uh, sorry, generic board startup, whatever that is. Um, then it seems to have some, uh, the MMC block device. Mm, that's not actually very interesting. Network service, CPU freak service, and so on. But the interesting thing is this one here. If we look at the critical chain, so we can see there that the, the default target is a graphical target. So it's going to run um, an X server and some kind of uh, GUI on top of that. Uh, that depends on multi-user target. Uh, then we have Getty target. And then we have something called Getty GS0 service, uh, which depends on, on a device. Um, so having a quick look at this um, uh, just yesterday, in fact, and trying to optimize this, the most obvious thing is that TTY GS0 uh, doesn't actually exist. And if you look at the, uh, the logs, if you look at the journal log, you see that there is a timeout after uh, 40 seconds or something uh, trying to initial, initialize this device. So the quick win is to remove uh, that service. 
So taking my Pocket Beagle and doing a few changes to the system deconfiguration. Uh, first thing I did is I switched from graphical uh, to multi-user default target because there is no display on this device. Uh, then I removed the offending GS0 uh, service. Um, and then I went through um, and actually these, yeah, I went through and removed a bunch of other services whilst I was at it, uh, which I knew I wasn't using. So I'm not using this as a robot uh, controller, so I could remove remote robot control. There was no Bluetooth uh, um, hardware on this device. And I don't really need an Apache web server running. So I hacked all those things out, ran systemd analyze again. Yeah, and it's quite good. So the kernel time is, well, it's slightly different, but that's just a random variation. Uh, the important thing is the user space boot time is now 12 seconds. So I've managed to shave 35 seconds off the boot time, which I regard as a win. Um, it's still kind of longer than I would like, and I had intended uh, to spend a bit time, more time uh, optimizing that, but I kind of uh, ran out of time doing that. But hey, so that's the kind of things you can do. That's the, the, that's the, I guess the key point here is we have uh, the uh, systemd analyze uh, uh, command, which allows you to get a list of uh, problem areas, and then you can go through looking at the units, looking at the, de at the dependencies, and removing stuff that isn't needed or is in the wrong order. So that's the main part of the talk. I've got a couple more slides before we're finished. Um, so in addition to uh, just the plain init daemon, which is what we've been talking about, uh, systemd comes with a whole bunch of other useful things. And so I want to mention just briefly the watchdog and the resource limits, both of which are kind of useful for the embedded use case. Uh, so here's an example of the watchdog you can, you can use uh, in a service. And just looking at the example there, we have watchdog sec, uh, restart on watchdog. So basically the watchdog sec says that if this uh, service isn't proddy by the, by the watchdog in uh, 30 seconds, then we're going to restart the service. So so long as the service is responding to watchdogs, uh, that's fine. But if it doesn't respond within 30 seconds, something's gone wrong, system D will then stop that service and then restart it. And you can also do this um, uh, other thing. You can put in a, a limit so you don't get into some kind of boot loop. So in the example here, uh, if we get four boots, for, sorry, four restarts in five minutes, then there is something seriously long, wrong with the system. In that case, we'll force a system reboot uh, and start over again. And the other really useful thing, in embed, uh, again, for the embedded use case, is to be able to set limits on the uh, resources used by a service. And in this example here, I'm just showing two of these things. Uh, we have CPU quota. Uh, that's the percentage of time that this uh, service is allowed to use. OK? So it can't use more than 20% of your CPU bandwidth which is kind of useful if you've got some real-time stuff going on as well, then you may want to make sure this doesn't uh, take up uh, too much of your bandwidth. And then the other thing, the memory uh, max option, this allows us to say how much memory, what's the memory quota of this device? Uh, in this case, it's set to 4 megs. There's a whole bunch of other stuff you can do with this. The manual page systemd resource control tells you a bunch, of other, a bunch of other things to do with I.O. scheduling and such like. And if you're interested in, on how this is actually implemented, it's all done through uh, control groups or C groups. But I'm not going to des describe that now. And that is basically it. There we go. So there's a quick run through systemd. Fancy stuff you can do with systemd. Any questions? I have a microphone here. No? Ah, yes. Okay. You have to come and get the microphone. Yes, okay. Let's try it like this. So, if you actually did the watchdog implementation, is it possible no. to do it? You, you need to go to the 
the microphone, otherwise nobody's going to hear what you're saying. Can somebody have that back, please? I'm sorry, if, if I take questions without the microphone, then it's not picked up by the recording, and then nobody knows what um, we're talking about. Alrighty. So about the watchdog, do you know if it's possible to implement it without needing to have specific system D related code in your application? Uh, no. I mean, so in order for the uh, in order for your service to respond to the watchdog prompts that which are going to come from system D, then yeah, you've got to write some code to do that. But is it's it only a little bit of code. But system D specific, you kind of import something, or is it where? What is the way? Okay, I have a further input on this. Well, you either use a lib system D, which in which case you have a one line of C code to just uh, trigger the watchdog, or you can just, at the end of the day, it's just writing in a socket that is made available by system D. So you can just check uh, an environment variable which tells you where the socket is and find out what you have to write in that socket and do it in whatever way you want. It's not very complicated. Okay, thank you for that. that. Uh, to, to answer the question, um, I assume you want to run some uh, shell script to do the watchdog uh, check. And I've written a small utility called healthdog. You can find it on GitHub where you, uh, it, it will wrap your program and automatically um, forward the exit code of your health uh, script to systemd so you don't have to um, change the target program and recompile it. Cool. Uh, what was the name of that uh, GitHub? Uh, oh, healthdog. Healthdog. Yeah. Okay, cool. Thanks. Okay, anyone else? Uh, <laughs> you may have to come. If you come to the front, then we'll, we'll pick you up next time around. I was wondering, because we've experienced that we've actually had problems because systemd was paralyzing too much, especially in combination with the watchdog, that our, uh, yeah, our services were already stopped because they weren't responding to the watchdog. Have you experienced something like that? That in some cases it's faster to actually not paralyze too much, to put in uh, some boundaries uh, so they can't paralyze too much? Yeah, I mean, so if you have uh, on, on boot, if uh, systemd is suddenly going to start up a million different services, then obviously that's going to consume all your CPU resources. So I guess the answer to that would be to put in the, 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 the ordering statements um, the, the after and before and so on, so that things uh, happen in a more, um, a more leisurely order, should we say. Mm -hmm. That's also what we put in there, yes. Yeah, yeah. Uh, behind you. Thank you. So a um, lot of embedded systems up till, I don't know, I guess recently have been, you know, using the BusyBox startup. I think build root ship with BusyBox startup by default at least a few years ago. Maybe I'm wrong about that. but. Um, at what point would you recommend switching to uh, System D from BusyBox? What, what would be the what would be the criteria you, you could suggest? Well, um, I mean that's kind of a general purpose question. Um, it is, yeah. So. <laughs> <laughs> I guess I mean the 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 the, the cop out answer would be at the point at which uh, BusyBox in it stops working for you. Fair um, enough. But thank you. Uh, but I think that, I mean, if, if you have a really small system and you have, um, you know, just a few megabytes of RAM and a few, a few megabytes of storage, then obviously you want to sh slim things down as much as possible. But if you've got a more complicated system with uh, multiple network demons doing various things, um, uh, you know, and, and control programs and so on, then systemd really is an advantage because you have all these extra facilities. I haven't even talked about the journaling yet, which allows you to um, to do journal, uh, do, do a logging, system logging in a flexible way, and to upload those logs securely to remote web, uh, remote servers, and so on. So it has a whole bunch of extra facilities which you just get, don't get if you're using a simple um, uh, either BusyBox in it or, or System Five in it. Okay, so it's more about the capabilities of System D than the boot time advantages it could give you. Um, yeah, I mean, the, the, if you have a system that's that simple, then um, probably BusyBox in it will be as fast or faster than System D. Okay. So in that, in that particular case, your, your advantage would come from the extra things that System D can do for you. Okay. Thank you. Hi, uh, would it be possible to open slide 25? 
I don't know. What is it? This one? And yeah, here, uh, if you see the second line, there is the device file, and on the fifth line, there is the UDEV trigger service. Did you make any optimization to improve the speed of these files? Mm, no, is a simple answer. Okay, thanks. <laughs> Sorry to be so terse on that. Oops. Excuse me. That, that's indicating time's up. Um, yeah, so uh, we, we can talk about this afterwards, but uh, I, the simple answer is no, I didn't. Uh, do you have time for one more question? Who's controlling this? Go on then. Um, maybe not really a question, but a comment to the gentleman in the gray t-shirt there who had the problem with the uh, um, paralyzation. Uh, it sounds very familiar, and I think uh, your second line, even it's a bit different, shows actually the reason, because of many of those embedded systems are very much uh, I.O. bound. Mm -hmm. uh, so they are I.O. limited, mm -hmm. and yeah. now System D coming from the server world, uh, they paralyze like crazy, mm -hmm. which is not n nice in our embedded systems. So the answer, the, the, the addition I would dare to make, uh, to make there is I would use System D analyze plot, which actually shows you uh, we, uh, which step takes how long, and it shows you whether you have a CPU bottleneck or an I.O. bottleneck. In most cases, what my experience, you do not have a CPU bottleneck, you have an I.O. bottleneck because it takes too long to read uh, all the executables and all the libraries from this slow MMC crap. Uh, so, uh, and the answer is then, as you, as you, uh, as you said, um, look there what takes long and then just add more after statements mm -hmm. there yeah. to, to get it not so parallel. Okay. So the system, the, there are two system the analyze things that uh, you didn't mention, which I would recommend. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the plot, which I said, and the dot. The dot is typically very intimidating, but that also tells you uh, that you have too much stuff ongoing. Okay. So probably throw something out. So cool. the system, the analyze has many hidden goodies there. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, so I think that's the end of the session. Thank you all very much, and um, yeah, enjoy the rest of the day.